What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at it again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 wrestling dream matches that didn't happen due to ego. Unfortunately, there are matches that, you know, in the past, us wrestling fans wanted to see and maybe possibly could have happened, but politics and ego gets in the way of probably a particular uh, set of wrestlers and the match never happens. And it always become uh, a fantasy booking scenario or what if scenario so we're gonna check out some of these moments that maybe were on the cusp of happening but uh you know egos maybe got into play politics got into play and it didn't happen appreciate all love and support original video will be linked down below uh it's by cultaholic wrestling let's get right into this one man. many reasons why a pro wrestling dream match <laughs> won't end up happening disagreements over money wrestlers never working in the same place at the same time yeah. bookers not considering mojo rawley a dream opponent etc <laughs> often though it simply boils down to the egos of the participants it could be an old grudge standing in the way of doing business one party refusing to lose to the other or yeah. something else entirely but there have been some mouth-watering clashes right there for the making before politics came into play yeah. i'm adam pachisi from cult Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestling dream matches that didn't happen due to ego. Join us. Number 10, Shawn Michaels versus Hulk Hogan, part two. Mm, we know right, about this so one. so Shawn Michaels versus Hulk Hogan did happen at SummerSlam 2005 in a match that is infamous for the Heartbreak Kid's outlandish overselling. <laughs> the reason why Michaels was flipping and flopping for all of the Hulkster's offense, however, is because he was miffed that Terrible Terry had nixed a planned rematch where Shawn would go over at the following month's Unforgiven. There would then supposedly be a decider, with Hulk coming out on top to win the series 2-1. The mooted sequel was scheduled to take place inside a steel cage, but Hogan pulled the classic that doesn't work for me brother card and ensured that his dalliance with the showstopper was a one and done deal. Damn. The red and yellow monster likely wasn't too thrilled with the idea of doing the favors for Michaels, even if he would ultimately get another win back himself, <laughs> but his opinion of his opponent degenerated during their feud as Michaels continually mocked <laughs> Hogan on TV. The tipping point came on Raw the night Right after SummerSlam, when HBK cut a sarcastic promo touting Hogan's agility and in-ring prowess, convincing Hulk that their <laughs> feud was well and truly over. Number nine, St <laughs> Oh, man, bro. Sean was like, all right, man. Fuck it. Fuck it. <laughs> I mean, he could have did that. He could have. He was going to win the series. He was going to win the feud. Like, I don't. I would have just been like, all right, you win this one, I win this one, you win the next one, and we have a, a good third one, and then, you know, I win it. Whatever. That's fine. But to just can it just because you don't want to lose to the guy, like, come on, bro. What, what are we doing? <laughs> Sting versus The Undertaker. It would have been great in 1995. Hell, it still would have been pretty damn good in 2005. And in 2015, well, it would have been quite the spectacle now, wouldn't it? When Sting, the mm -hmm. last holdout from WCW, finally made his WWE debut at Survivor Series 2014, many fans instantly yep. began booking the icon against the dead man. That, it was the natural- I remember, it was such a huge buzz like okay we finally get to see sting and the undertaker wrestlemania let's get it going imagine just imagine sting would have won his first wrestlemania match here's triple h in the game imagine he would have won it now i don't think i believe he ended up facing seth rollins for the for the title obviously i think seth still should have probably won that uh, it only makes sense for Seth to still win that because, you know, Sting doesn't need the title. He's Sting. He's already that guy or whatnot. But if they could have built up a feud at some point for the Undertaker and Sting at WrestleMania, that would have been a main event match because everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people always wanted to know if Sting and the Undertaker ever went at it, who would win? That shit would be fucking legendary. And, oh man, and just, just to put it out there, say, for example, would y'all be okay if Sting was the one to bring the Undertaker streak? Just, just throwing it out there. If it ever did, 
we was in the alternate timeline. Would y'all be okay with it, or would y'all still prefer maybe a younger talent? That's just a question I want to ask. Would y'all prefer a younger talent to do it, or would y'all trip if it was Steam to be the Undertaker streak? match to make for a variety of reasons, but it never ended up happening. Instead, Sting faced off against Triple H at WrestleMania 31, while Taker returned from Lesnar-induced hibernation and further derailed Bray Wyatt's momentum. By the time- Yeah, yeah, and this was after he already, un you know, lost the streak, but I'm just saying, in a sense, if the streak was never broken, would y'all be okay if, if everything else still went According to plan, streak was never broken. Sting comes into the company later on. Would y'all be okay with Sting beating the Undertaker at WrestleMania? That's the question. When WrestleMania 32 came around a year later, Steve Borden was retired and being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, and the Phenom was scrapping with Shane McMahon inside Hell in a Cell. The window had passed, but why wasn't the bout booked a year prior, especially yeah. when Sting was so keen for it? Well, according to some cryptic comments made by Mark Calloway, the backstage belief was that the match looked better on paper, with Sting adding that Vince wanted one last WCW versus WWE themed bout, hence him inexplicably doing the job to the yeah. cerebral assassin. So Number eight, Steve Austin versus Brock Lesnar. Once they did that, I was like, uh, no, no, I, I did not like that, bro. I didn't like that at all. Uh, it was cool for nostalgia purposes, but Sting still should have went over. They just, that's millions and millions of dollars they left on the table. Nah. By the time the June 10th, 2002 know about episode this of Raw rolled around, Steve Austin was physically and mentally burned out. Yeah. His body was breaking down and he was creatively disillusioned, not only with the direction of his own character, but the company in general. Being asked to put over newcomer Brock Lesnar in a random King of the Ring qualifying match without any build whatsoever yeah. was the last straw. He's like, nope, I'm Stone not doing Cold that. famously took his ball and went home, scuppering a take Hasty clash between him and the next big thing in the process. Thing is, the Texas Rattlesnake really had every right to veto the match and the result, considering his status compared to Lesnar's at the time. Yeah. Austin did say he would be happy to do business with Brock down the line if it was built up properly and, you know, happened on a major pay-per-view and not yes. some random episode of Raw. Injuries prevented that from ever happening, but Austin was reportedly offered a match with the Beast Incarnate at WrestleMania 39, turning it down after he and WWE failed to come to terms on a suitable agreement. Wow. Number seven, Chris Jericho. That's crazy. Seeing Austin with fucking Brock, that would be insane. That would definitely be insane, and they could have definitely played that up. Definitely could have played up what happened many years ago. But I'm always in agreement. You really had him in a qualifying match on a random Monday Night Raw to lose? It's stone cold. He deserves better than that. It's stone cold. He helped you win the Monday Night Wars. Stone cold Steve Austin. What are we talking about? He was still mega popular. He will always be mega popular. He does not need to be losing in a qualifying match on a random Monday Night Raw. That's just with no build, no nut. Nah, bro. It's Stone Cold, bro. He deserves better. Go versus Goldberg. They got there in the end, but for a long time, it felt like Chris Jericho and Goldberg would never have a match with one another. Mm -hmm. Not through any lack of effort on Jericho's part, of course, because he was bound and determined to get Big Bill in the ring when the two worked for WCW in 1998. The Canadian mocked and taunted the man for weeks, <laughs> making fun of his persona and entrance. He even beat a fake Goldberg at the Fall Brawl pay-per-view, seemingly sowing the seeds for a scrap with the real deal further down the line. Nope. According to Jericho, Goldberg had zero desire to work with him in any form or fashion, That's believing crazy. that comedy storylines were beneath him and that he should really only have been working with main event level talent. Damn. Jericho, for his part, didn't want to have a competitive 
competitive match with the World Heavyweight Champion and was happy just to be squashed so long as it went down on pay-per-view. In the end, Goldberg agreed to spear Y2J in the entranceway, thus ending their feud. <laughs> it was this display of egotism that convinced Jericho to see out his WCW contract and try his luck in WWE. That's crazy, Number six, man. Antonio Inoki versus Akira Maeda. He just was trying to the make bad a, a boy of funny 1980s moment. Japanese wrestling, Akira Maeda was no stranger to controversy. Whether it was that bizarre match with a drunk Andre the Giant where neither man had an interest in cooperating, or the time he broke Ricky Choshu's face with a shoot kick, Maeda had yeah. a reputation for doing his own thing. And that extended to working, or rather not wanting to work with, New Japan pro wrestling founder, booker and top star Antonio Inoki. The two men met many times in tag bouts, but only in one singles match in 1983, which Anoki won. Despite there being big money to be made with a full-on program between the two, it didn't come to pass due to Maeda's unwillingness to work with the chin star. Akira and Anoki had some major heat backstage, and Maeda yeah. used his clout as a top star to pass on a series of matches. The big sticking point was, predictably, Anoki's refusal to put over his under study. This wound Maeda up to no end, leading to the unprofessional behavior that caused him to leave New Japan and start a rival promotion. Oh, Number five, The Elite versus CM Punk. Uh, Look, we, we should have all known one. when CM Punk decided to return to wrestling for AEW that it would all end in biting, shoot chair shots, suspensions, and firings, right? The Straight Edge Superstars backstage beefs with the likes of Hangman Page, The Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega have regrettably cost us what would have been some seriously good pro wrestling matches. Regardless Bruh. of who was right or wrong, and let's be honest, the whole saga feels like one big subjective grey area, it is a shame that these so-called professionals can't find a way to move past it for the sake of business. Because Punk versus Omega, or Punk and a partner versus the Young Bucks, or Punk and FTR versus the Elite, would surely lead bro. to an uptick in AEW interest, so resulting in higher money, ratings, bro. bigger live gates, and more pay-per-view buys. However, at the time of recording at least, all evidence indicates that if CM Punk does return to the company, then he is unlikely to face the Elite and may even be on an entirely separate brand. Obviously, he's recorded this before Collision and stuff like that, but it's just so, so fucking stupid, bro. Like, I believe there was reports he was trying to be one of the mystery partners for um, the Blood and, Gut ma Blood and Guts match, and both sides said no. I think Moxley was okay with it, but everybody else was like, no. And it's just like, what are y'all doing, bro? Y'all are y'all biggest detrimental to the company. And Tony Khan is just sitting there. What are we? I can't, no matter how much we are not a big fan of Vince McMahon's bookings and his decisions, I don't think I can ever really recall a time of some multiple wrestlers telling Vince McMahon no we're not working with this guy and that's it and there's no repercussions no, nothing happens what it's rare that anybody tell Vince McMahon no let alone a multitude of people saying nah we ain't doing this when there's millions to be made y'all get paid more t hey Hey, man. To each his own. Number four, The Rock versus Shawn Michaels. Back in the day, Shawn Michaels was a real piece of work. Yeah. As arrogant and hard to manage as he was talented, Michaels made many enemies in the first yes, half did. of his career. Definitely and that did. included Get a young a Dwayne Johnson, who, rumor has it, has harbored a grudge against the heartbreak kid ever since he witnessed Michaels being disrespectful to his grandmother when Michaels wrestled for his family's promotion way back when. Uh... Relations didn't improve when Shawn was top dog in WWE in the mid to late 90s and Rocky Maivia was a young blue chipper looking to find a foothold. Michaels, along with close friend and confidant Triple H, were, shall we say, less than welcoming to the third generation star? 
Many years later, when the boy toy had returned from his four-year injury layoff and The Rock was the most electrifying man in all of entertainment, DJ put the kibosh on a match with HBK. WWE would have liked to have booked it, but the people's champion wasn't about to do business with somebody he really didn't like on a personal level. Damn. The two eventually mended fences and Michaels now helps train Johnson's daughter in NXT. Number three. Which is, it's crazy how time... Time does, it, it does heal all wounds. It, it, it should be able to, you know, over, you know, end all beefs. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad they was able to reconcile that. And the fact that he is helping training his own daughter, it, it actually comes full circle. The person you never really liked, didn't want to have a match with, is now training your daughter. It's, for, it's crazy how just time can heal all things, man. Bret Hart versus Hulk Hogan. The ending of WrestleMania 9 was famously one of the most infuriating ever, particularly for Bret Hart. Yeah. The Hitman dropped the WWE title to Yokozuna, who then immediately lost it to Hulk Hogan in That's... an impromptu farce of a match. That's Bret was up, relatively bro. okay with it at the time, since he had been promised that the Hulkster would pass the torch to him properly at SummerSlam. Oh, Bret. Poor, sweet, naive, handsome Brett. You did Months know. before their proposed match, Hogan know. had one of his customary changes of heart, no pun intended, yeah. and decided that he would rather drop the title back to Yokozuna at King of the Ring, thanks to an exploding camera, rather than lose clean to the excellence of execution. Hart was, naturally, a bit hurt about having yeah. his main event WWE title torch passing moment taken away from him and has used the situation to routinely knock Hulk over the years. The only time they did meet in a televised one-on-one -on -one match was over five years later on a random episode of Nitro with Brett winning by DQ and no follow-up because WCW. <laughs> Number two, Brock Damn. Lesnar versus Kevin Owens. Deep down, he may be a simple country farm boy from Webster, South Dakota, I I but hear about Brock Lesnar is no fool when it comes to the pro wrestling business. The Beast has negotiated some of the most lucrative contracts in history, while For essentially sure. being able to pick and choose when he wants to work. Yep. He can also, apparently, choose who he wants to work with. And according to Scuttlebutt, aka Road Dog, on that podcast of his, Kevin Owens is not one of those people. It wasn't specified exactly when Lesnar rejected the chance to work with the prize fighter, but it was likely during KO's run as Universal Champ. Brock and Kevin did have one non-televised outing at a Madison Square Garden house show on March 12, 2017, which took place between Owens dropping the Universal title and Lesnar challenging Goldberg for it at WrestleMania uh... 33. You will be surprised to hear that Brock ate him up within two minutes and pinned him following an F5. If Lesnar was motivated and these two were given a decent chunk of time, the results could be spectacular. Facts. Come on, Brock. Number one. Yeah, I don't know why he doesn't want to work with him. Uh, that that's that's a fucking that's a match that that's a money making match for sure. Steve Austin versus Hulk Hogan. The ultimate one. WWE really only had one shot to book the dream match to end all dream matches at yep. WrestleMania 19. And they blew it. <laughs> Not really, of course, because yeah. trying to get Steve Austin and Hulk Hogan to square off in a singles match was a political minefield that nobody knew how to successfully navigate. Pretty much all of the resistance came from the bionic redneck, as Austin didn't feel as though their styles would mesh well in the ring. Mm. Hulk was older and way less mobile than he had been in years prior, while Austin's injuries were beginning to catch up with him, leading Stone Cold to predict the match would be awkward and disappointing to fans. Damn. Also, you know, there was that little detail about who would lay down for the other one. Yeah. It's very unlikely that Austin would have wanted to do a job for Hogan, and likely vice versa, although this has never been outright proven. Bottom line is, Austin was pitched the match on several occasions and stomped a mud hole in the idea every time. Seeing how Hogan ended up completely stealing his Mania Dream match with The Rock, yeah. he's probably glad that he did. It, it worked. It worked better in the end, man. Ah, that's that's crazy. I, I want to pass off that question to you. If we ever did get Hogan versus Austin at a WrestleMania back then, who would y'all would have wanted to win? Who would y'all have go over? Would it be Stone Cold Steve Austin going over Hulk Hogan, or would it be Hulk Hogan going over Stone Cold? Me personally, I definitely would have picked Stone Cold because pretty much 
Hulk Hogan had the golden years, as they say, of wrestling or whatnot. But once he ended up, once things started switching and he ended up going to WCW and he had to find that character change, Stone Cold became the next guy. He was the Attitude Era, you know. And of course, with everyone else, I was a part of that. So I'm not going to take away The Rock, Undertaker, Mankind, Triple H. But we knew Stone Cold was the draw. He was. He was their next, next mega star. And then you have The Rock who was right there. Like when Stone Cold went out, The Rock became the next mega star. So in my opinion, I would have had a passing of the torch moment because we knew, we knew, everyone knows, even Hulk Hogan don't want to admit it, but the peak of wrestling was in the Attitude Era with Stone Cold as pretty much the very top, top guy. It's as simple as that. So I would have had Stone Cold win that WrestleMania match, passing over the torch. I think that would have been cool, man. So comment down below. Let me know who do you guys think would have should have won that match stone cold or the under uh, not the undertaker or uh um hulk hogan if they ever had a match at wrestlemania but i appreciate all the love and support you guys shown on channel road 250k and i'm still your undisputed youtube wrestling champion of the world appreciate y'all kicking beans in y'all next one peace